When I was about four years old, my mom had a knife in her hand, standing on her bed, threatening my dad. I'm about to be arrested. That's like grand theft auto and destruction and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, a lot of fun. All of Christianity is a train wreck, and the leader is the Roman Catholic Church. Pitch me, what's your idea? Why in the most abundant country in the history of the universe are people living on the streets? We went out there to feed people. Turns out that food is the number one connector. We're not gonna make any progress criminalizing the issue of homelessness. You cannot experience something that is not completely lived. We're only here for a puff of smoke. <laughs> and I'll be there with the crackheads, the glue sniffers, and the prostitutes. It's where I want to die, here in our community. Alan Graham is really making a difference in the lives of the homeless here in Austin, and I can't wait to share his story. But first, please subscribe to Dad Saves America. Hit that like button. Let YouTube know that you want more positive, can-do things in your feed so that we can help this country be a better place. Alan, welcome to Dad Saves America. Great to be here, man. Thank you. So I'm very excited for this conversation because I have been hearing about your work at Community First Village for years. So let's just start off with what is it? What is Community First Village? Well, uh, currently it is a 51-acre master plan community designed specifically to lift the chronically homeless men and women of the streets of Austin off the streets into a place that they can heal and hopefully rediscover a purpose in their life. In the simplest of ways, that's, that's what it is. But it started off as a, an RV park and became an RV park on steroids. And that has gained uh, uh, very significant national attention. In fact, uh, uh, 80 people have flown in today to start a two and a half day symposium on how they can replicate this in their cities. Give me a snapshot of the impact. I want I, This whole conversation is gonna be about going deep into so many of the things you've learned from being with these people who are experiencing homelessness. What makes what you're doing different than um, a, a shelter, for example? And, and what's the impact? What's the result? Well, you, you first have to begin with the why. Are people out there up underneath our bridges and on our street corners? And we believe very profoundly that the single greatest cause to homelessness is a profound catastrophic loss of family. Because in your family and everyone's family that is listening uh, to this, there's a drug addict, an alcoholic, or somebody battling a mental health issue inside your family right now. And somehow our families, which are the safety net uh, to everyone, are able to come up underneath uh, those men and women to prevent them from cataclysmically finding their way out onto the streets. But for an extremely small uh, population of people, less than 1% of 1% of our population, the nuclear family has you know, been blown to smithereens and uh, the Forge family that would have been around that nuclear family doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so that's the why. And then um, the how piece of it, is built very simply on Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And just after God has created the Garden of Eden, he then takes the man, settles him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. Three big words. Settle, this is a God call. Yep. Cultivate, work, whatever those giftings are that we've been blessed with, and to care for something outside of who we are. And so uh, the model and the foundation of that uh, community called Community First Village is uh, built on that uh, single uh, scripture sentence based upon the profound catastrophic loss of family. How does the results for people that come into the community differ to, to what you've seen in other attempts to help people who are in these situations? In the most simplest of ways, they're no longer on the streets. Mm -hmm. The collateral benefits of that to everyone are extreme. 
there's a collateral benefit to the community, uh, which is struggling. You and I are struggling as a community with our neighbors that find themselves on our street corners. And then there's um, the impact uh, to the individual uh, that is no longer on the streets, has a place to, to heal, to prepare nutritious foods, to hydrate, uh, to seek uh, better health care, uh, you know, for themselves. But we are not a fix and repair model. In fact, we don't believe that we can actually fix and repair much in who you and I are as as human beings. And when you, when you look at where these men and women come from, the layers of trauma uh, that their life has been built on. Yeah. Uh, beginning, you know, from the very beginning. I mean, their mothers and daddies may have been smoking crack while they were in the womb and uh, and then feeding them uh, things like heroin, opiates, in order to knock them out so they could have parties. And then the physical yeah. and sexual abuse and things that that build and crescendo into a life of, uh, of trauma uh, can be uh, pretty incredible. And then I have this kind of fundamental, simple philosophy that there are things about us that we're not going to fix. So... Are you married? I am. Yeah. yeah. How many years? Yeah. Coming up on 20 years. Yeah. So um, whatever it is that ticks her off about you <laughs> are the same things that was ticking her off back in 2004 and five. I'm sure that's true. And vice versa. <laughs> and so if you take my wife and myself, uh, we've been together. We'll be married 39 years together, 42 years. Uh, Bravo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my best friend, partner in life. I couldn't have yeah. done uh, what, what I'm doing without uh, her, our five children, the whole the whole deal. If I wrapped a billion dollars in $100 bills in cellophane on a pallet and put it at a location and just asked her to get there on time. <laughs> or it'll be taken. <laughs> or somebody else gets it. Yeah. Can't get there. And, and I'm over embellishing this, but it's, it's a truism. Whereas me, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the parking lot 20 minutes ahead of time. Uh, I'm going to be here early. That's on time for me. If you're in a meeting that involves Alan Graham, that Alan Graham is running, that meeting's going to start at a Apple Watch time, uh, precisely at whatever the designated time frame was. If you're not there, uh, and you come in later and ask a question that's already been answered, it, it's, it's not pretty for you. <laughs> and so um, that's my deal. That's my wife's deal. And how do I learn uh, to accept those things about her and cease trying to fix that problem or her trying to fix me. There's a saying about wisdom and knowing the difference between what we can and can't change, right? <laughs> yeah. Nothing is more true than in relationships with that, right? Yeah, yeah. So walk me through exactly what Community First Village is. What does it look like when I walk into the, onto this property? You know, what are, the, what are the components of it? Well, currently it's a 51-acre uh, master plan community, expanding right now by 127 acres. Oh, wow. So we're going to go from the current about 530, 40 homes to about 1,900 homes over the next few years. What does that mean for your size relative to the chronically homeless population in Austin? Where, um, where, where are you on that? Yeah, I would guess that on any given night, there's three or 4,000 people on the streets. People really don't know uh, that number yeah. of that uh, Half or more are chronically homeless. So you're building something that has the, the capacity to provide a place for e potentially every chronically homeless person yeah, you, in this you, city. Yeah, you have to assume that uh, no more are coming in unless you go upstream and yeah. fix the catastrophic loss of family and then all the other systemic issues that are exacerbating the foster care system, the mental health system, physical health, living wage, education, criminal justice system, all the things that people get dumped into once their family implodes on them, um, we're, we're going to be stuck with this, especially in our intense, large urban environments like in Austin would be. What was the genesis of this idea of, of, of doing 
these these tiny perm because they're permanent structures. They're not mobile homes. Yeah, well, right? um, or they the original genesis was we went and bought one gently used recreational vehicle, a fifth wheel, lifted one guy up off the streets and placed that person into a privately owned RV park. That was the genesis. Then I bought a second, a third, a fifth, a 20th, a 50th, all along planning on this idea that we could build a community around that model. But the model has evolved somewhat. You know, basically there's a few products within our community right now. There's a, what's called a park model RV. It's not yeah. an RV, it's a mobile home. Uh, that is about 400 square feet, 399 square feet to be precise. And then we site build, stick build on site microhomes that have no plumbing, fully furnished, fully electric, uh, that are 200 square feet or less. But no plumbing? No plumbing. Well, what's the what's the premise there? Just because the infrastructure, it's hard to get the plumbing to the... There's a cost element yeah. uh, to, to that. Uh, there's a community element. So there's, like a, there's communal sort of a yeah. bathroom facilities and showers and, right. and all of that. We can rent uh, these units for cheaper, and mm -hmm. there's there's a choice element to that, you know? Yeah. Hey, I want to live in one of these units. Uh, I'm happy to walk, you know, 50 feet to my bathroom. We, we call our 51 acres a 51-acre, 550-bedroom mansion, you know? And this... Unit is your bedroom. Just walk out the door and you'll be at uh, within really a few steps at one of 12 different very high-end laundry restroom shower facilities or very high-end outdoor kitchens. Can anyone come and who's on the street and uh, be a part of this community? Is there a way to sort of vet whether people are ready to participate? Because if when you've got a, a close-knit community like that, I got to imagine there's a certain amount of um, tending to the garden of the community, so to speak. Yeah. Right? So yeah. how does so that work? A lot, of, a lot of hoops to jump through to get into the community. One is sticking uh, to our mission of serving the chronically homeless. And there's a definition around this. And What is that definition? An unaccompanied male or female, no children, with a disabling condition. That disabling condition can be physical, mental, or addiction. Having lived on the streets of Austin, or this little central Texas area, Travis County-ish, yeah. uh, for at least a year, are episodically homeless, adding up to a year over a four-year period of time, period. That's very important. Uh, federal guidelines, uh, fa fair housing, there's lots of things that, um, that govern you know, what we can do and how we can limit you, for instance, wanting to come in and, and move into our community. I want to take a step all the way back to the beginning. Why did this become your mission? How did how did that start? Where did that start for you? Take me to the, the seed of this. That's complicated. Uh, my, my mother was profoundly mentally ill. And the only memory that I have of my mother and father as a husband and wife was probably when I was about four years old and my mom had a knife in her hand standing on her bed threatening my dad. That's that's the only memory that I have of them oh. uh, together. Wait, Next where thing is I, this? Are you, in, you here, are you here in this area in Texas? No, I'm in uh, the Houston uh, area, okay. Bel Air. Next thing I know, my mom is uh, in the hospital and I have a little brother that uh, was probably about one, maybe a little younger uh, at the time and then two older brothers. One seven, another one eight. Uh, while my mom was institutionalized in the hospital. And who did that? Who, how did that come to be that she ended up in the hospital? Did well, uh, that's a great question. I don't know the precise answer to yeah. that. Uh, it wasn't I like family or neighbors or you're not sure? No, uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, my mom had something going for her. It, it wasn't going to be my dad. My dad ended up. Uh, filing divorce on my mom while she was hospitalized and unleashed uh, an Armageddon of a custody battle for oh, me boy. and my brothers, trying to strip my mother of her maternal rights. Uh, but my mom had a mom and dad who loved her very deeply, and they happened to be uh, very well-resourced. Uh, they would 
they would be millionaires in the in the 1950s and 60s. My okay. grandfather was a successful guy, and my mom ended up in in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, there's a hospital there called Minigers, which to this day stands at the pinnacle of mental health research in the world. So, uh, yeah, so she, she ended up there. And she was fortunate uh, in that way. She was fortunate in that yeah. way. And um, and then my grandparents also came up underneath my mother and said, no, uh, John, my father, you're, you're not going to strip her. And I'm, I'm, we're going to have the most badass lawyers on the planet uh, <laughs> battle this deal. And they, and they did. And my mom spent a year there, but she was subjected to all of the psychotropic big drugs of the time and electric shock therapy. What was the year? Like what approximately? 59, 60. And, and the state of the treatment for this was what it was. It, what was it? Was I it would say good? that the statement of treatment, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody may not be any better today than right. it was, but then it's very drug, uh, related. There's great drugs in the world. I'm not arguing against drugs. I'm a fan of the pharma, um, but they're overused. Yeah. Uh, and they were overused on my mom and, uh, they're overused on my neighbors that, uh, that live in our village and they're abused, frankly. So you have this up close experience of mental health breakdown and your family being ripped apart. We, we go back to live with my mom. We were living with my father and stepmother, but we go back with her and she converts to Roman Catholicism. Hmm. What was the faith of her parents? Uh, probably Methodist, uh, okay. you know, a mainline uh, Protestant. How does she get exposed to Catholicism? What, I mean, I think that my next door neighbors uh, were Catholic. And uh, so there was probably some influence there, but my mom died in 1989. So okay. I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, I'm talking to my oldest brother on the phone and I'm going, what, what, what was it? And he goes, oh, you don't know? And I go, no, what? He goes, well, she was in our backyard. The backyard was full of uh, baseballs, frisbees, footballs, and an untold quantity of dog poo. <laughs> and... My mom has this vision of a saint. This is my brother telling me this deal that tells her to go and, you know, into the church. And I go, what saint? And uh, he goes, I don't know, you know, and I'm dying to know. Yeah. It's a big thing. And your mom, your mom was alive at this point, or this is after her passing that you're having this conversation? Oh, well, after her passing. Okay. All right. So you can't just ask her. They can't ask her. Okay. And, uh. My brother writes everything down. I'm the opposite of that. So <laughs> uh, says, I think I've gotten it written down. I go, you got to find that, bro. And, uh, I don't remember. But it's never been uh, found. So I'm going to pretend that it was Francis of Assisi, who's kind of a thing. He's a good one. It's a good one. I, I look at that period of time as really being the genesis. But fast forward a lot. I get into my latter teen years, and I'm abandoning uh, my faith with gusto, man. Well, before you get, before you abandon it, so she adopts yeah. Catholicism, she converts. And drags us all into the church. Okay, so We're she, going to mass, first communion, So how old are you when you get sucked into going to mass and all, and the whole uh, thing? Six years old. Okay, so early, early enough. Uh, early, early on. It's uh, the faith experience you understand. It's your, it's no, your faith. No, I didn't, no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I loved going to mass uh, with her. I became an altar server. Even as a teenager? Uh, early. <laughs> I went early. to 12 years of Catholic school, so I, yeah, I yeah. understand. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, we went through elementary school you know, with the nuns and the whole deal. Yeah. Holy Ghost uh, Catholic school in Bel Air. And uh, uh, good, good experience. But then mom's mental health began to implode. Again. Uh, Again. Well, it did when I was in third grade, and then again when I was in eighth grade. And so in eighth grade, uh, you know, it's uh, late 60s, 1969, 1970. I mean, everything is uh, collapsing in my family. Uh, wow. 
drugs, alcohol, lots of things coming in. So not just with your mom, but also other members of your family as well? Well, we're all yes. experimenting. Uh, yeah. We're all growing up in that period of time. Uh, it was a... Uh, it's the summer of love era, uh, all, so to speak. All of that, and uh, my mother had no control over these four boys. And so uh, there was no man in the house. Uh, so did your dad just cease to be in your life after the... I wouldn't say ceased. My dad was not an abusive man. He uh, just wasn't present. Uh, you, you got the every other weekend uh, thing. And basically yeah. the way that I look at it and remember it, we were labor, you know, for mowing the yard and right. uh, stuff like that. But there was no baseball, football, scouting, or any of the things that you would normally, that I got to do. So you're a teenager. You're, you and your brother's are tearing the town apart. Tell me about this time. Well, uh, by 1969, 70, my brothers are going to be graduating from high school. So I'm in eighth grade. They're about to go off to, uh, to college. And it's Easter Sunday, 1970. And I am, uh, I've got two tickets to see Led Zeppelin on their Led Zeppelin two tour at the Huffines Pavilion. And this was a, a, a big deal. I'm a rocker to the core of who I am. And I don't know, it was about 11 o'clock, maybe noon on that day, and the knock comes on our door, and there's several Houston Police Department cruisers out wow. there. Several? Several. I'm about to be arrested. And uh, they called it car theft. I called it borrowing and joyriding and, and cars. Uh, I was going to give it back, officer. Yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't. Uh, in fact... Uh, it just happened to be destroyed. What happened to the car? Well, there were several cars okay. that, we, uh, that me and some buddies in a vacant field got into a great destruction derby. Oh, so you literally did totally get a bunch of cars and destroy them. And completely it's... destroyed them. <laughs> and, um, and so, I'm laughing, but holy yeah, cow. No, no it's, uh, it was a great experience. And so I'm sitting being booked at the Houston Police Department. Can I just stop and say, you were living like every boy's dream when you were doing no, that. No, there's no question. I mean... I, I, I had the ultimate freedom. It but, is crime and theft. Yeah. But man, oh man, that must have been so much fun. Well, it's primal. <laughs> it was a primal uh, piece of who we are. The amygdala in the back of our... The f fight or flight piece of our brain. And then the smash cars part. Which that, is... uh, <laughs> you know, that's how we learned how to survive out in a world that wasn't very friendly uh, uh, to you and I as humans. So yeah, that's like Grand Theft Auto and destruction and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, there were drugs and alcohol involved in, uh, in, in that uh, type of deal, which is way too premature and not good for anyone for that matter. And simultaneously, my mom is uh, is uh, struggling uh, yeah. again. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm being booked and I'm asking the police officer if he could call my mommy. Now, how old are you? This is 1970. How 14 old are you? You're 14. Old. March uh, 29th. You haven't reached yet what I understand to be the peak year of criminality for young men, which I believe is 17. Yeah. yeah. So is this the intervention that halts your collapse into utter depravity or what? It moderates it uh, to a level that made it uh, sustainable to get me through the, the those other years that you just talked about. So uh, didn't completely eliminate it, but uh, I'm in the uh, juvenile detention center in Harris County and uh, my mom is imploding and nobody's coming to get me. I'm thinking that my next uh, address is going to be in Gatesville, which is the where the juvenile detention prison is in Gatesville, Texas. Right. And is everybody uh, involved underage? Under so your age. older brothers that you didn't you didn't suck your older brothers fully into your. My oldest brother is the intellectual uh, of the group. My second oldest brother uh, is the academic uh, of the group, and my baby brother just got screwed in the whole uh, deal, and he's a mess. Uh, mental health issues, addiction issues, and uh, uh, that whole deal. I, I turned out to be what what I am. People can describe whatever that is. You're some mix. Uh, well, I, I got a lot of everything in there, and uh, but I'm not very academic. That's for sure. Uh, 
you were spared that vice then. I, I was, uh, <laughs> thank God, to be honest with you, we wouldn't be sitting here today if, uh, if that. You'd be busy still researching what's the right way to address this systemic problem, blah, blah, blah. That's, thing, that's exactly of... right. Yeah. So I'm in this juvenile detention center for two weeks, and um, uh, it's not a very pleasant uh, experience. And, uh, you know, I had some uh, conflicts inside there, uh, people. I was fairly large for my age. I had matured early. So I'm an eighth grader at 14 years old with full capability, beard. Just looking like a man. Looking like a man. And, um, and people would want to challenge that, and it, it, it didn't work out well for them. I got challenged in church one day. I'm sitting on the, in a pew, and a kid comes in, and he goes, uh, that's my seat you're sitting in. Well, I'm not moving. And, uh, and then he tried to forcefully move him, and it, uh, it did not turn out well for him. And uh, So you've got some fortitude, Alan. I've got some fortitude. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, in two weeks, my father, and this is really important, too, in the context of the profound catastrophic loss of family, my dad comes and gets me out. Right. Okay. And I go yeah. live with him and my stepmother. And was it you and your baby brother? Or, I mean, was it Well, how, he who, ultimately who? came. Yeah. Uh, initially, he didn't. What comes next? So you've got... A certain amount of chaos, but you do have a broader safety net of your family, your grandparents, your dad. You make it through the teen years. What comes next that sets you on this path to helping these people who are out, out here on the streets? Well, in high school, I got into football. Uh, it's Texas. It's Texas. I'm, I'm, <laughs> You're I, big. I get elected to the student council. Uh, I ascend almost always to top leadership roles. I don't know whether it's... Uh, inherent in who I am or if it's narcissistic. One of those things in high school was I became president of an organization called TARS, Teens Aid the Retarded. And um, this is a it was very a, of its time name. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it morphed into Special Olympics and stuff like that. But um, I ended up in pretty deep relationships with intellectually disabled uh, people. Uh, primarily Down syndrome types. And, um, and look, a lot of it was to hang around with the chicks. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I had, Like everything when you're a teenage boy, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but I had, a, I had a ball. I had a summer intern, paid internship, uh, you know, one summer. And Was there a relationship that you remember from that? Those can be really... Oh, yeah, uh, many. You know, I was a softball coach for our deal. Uh, we would travel uh, back then. Before there was the National Special Olympics, there were the Texas Special Olympics, and uh, we would go and compete. You know, in these track meet type of deals, yeah. and uh, we'd we go up to Fort Worth or to Houston, or uh, you know, and it was those were just a ball. I came across this video on Facebook of a Down syndrome. Uh, presenting and testifying before Congress. Uh, and in the background, you've got the Down syndrome guy here. And then in the back is an audience full of Down syndrome people. And this Down syndrome guy was extremely articulate and was arguing for stopping uh, eugenics against Down syndrome. You do not want to eliminate us out of the population. And he he goes, and the most important reason why is that you want to study our genetic makeup so that you can understand why we are the happiest people in the world. And that floored me. And that's and totally true. Totally true. Yeah, I've had... Several totally experiences true. over my life with and folks. You, could, you could run a 100-yard dash at this Texas Special Olympics, lose by a mile, and be pumping your fist in the air. You know? You know, it's so funny to think about that because we're living in this time that in one sense is the wealthiest time in, in all of human history, and yet in the wealthiest country, America, we have so much brokenness. We've got so much depression and anxiety and suicide and these things that suggest that at the level of our own happiness, we're not necessarily making progress. Like our progress on the happiness front at the level of the society has kind of stalled. 
And man, he was right. Like, there's a lot we can probably learn from why those folks are so happy. Yeah. There's an organization in Georgetown called BIG, uh, which is a residential facility for intellectually disabled uh, folks. It's a phenomenal place because if you have an intellectually disabled child, you know that you're going to probably die before they do. And how do you how do you care for that child if you don't have other children that are going to, I mean, it's a complex situation. So they built this residential community and it is phenomenal. And they had this gala every year in Georgetown. And I got to tell you, I hate galas, but I love this one. <laughs> and all of the products that are being uh, silent auctioned and live auctioned off are primarily products that are made in partnership with these intellectually disabled uh, people. When an item of their sales, uh, they're over there cheering on. And in our population, we kind of do a similar thing. And, you know, I might commission you uh, to make a piece of art for me uh, so we could sell in our auction. I might pay you $500 for that piece of art, which is a fair piece, but I might auction that thing off for $10,000. It's how it works. Yeah. And, and my neighbors get pissed. <laughs> like, and when you say your neighbors, you're talking about the, the folks in the community. Yeah, non-intellectually disabled, yeah. uh, but formerly chronically homeless, yeah. uh, privileged, entitled uh, people. Uh, you got the, the contrast of people yelling and pumping their fists in the ears to, uh, why, why did you uh, screw you took me my money. take advantage of me like this? Um, what comes next? Well, I'm in Austin, Texas. I uh, move up here in 1976 to go to UT, and by 1978, uh, dropped out. I was a complete fail. Uh, Why? I would put a combination of two things. I'm, I'm not a good student. Uh, the classroom is not my uh, jam. Smoking pot probably didn't help much uh, yeah. during that period of time. And so by uh, 1978, I'm working in a photo map booth, you know, a little kiosk in a parking lot of a Safeway uh, grocery store. And a, a buddy of mine drives up in a brand new 1978 Mercury marquee, white, wearing a suit, air conditioning blowing on him. And he, you know, hands over these little canisters of film to get uh, processed. He's in the real estate business, and it looks like he's making a lot of money. He's doing pretty good. He, it looks good. Yeah. I got into the real estate business, and really uh and metaphorically uh, i learned how to say and to spell the word entrepreneur and that was a game changer uh, for me so what is an entrepreneur from your perspective what's your definition it's it's someone that's willing to risk all that they have for a purpose it's a good definition someone that's yeah. willing to risk everything they have for a purpose i yeah. like that you know one of the things i always think about and we talk about it here, and just it's, it's a big part of how I think about the world is that we, we put business and entrepreneurship in this box, like, oh, it's to make a profit or this or that. But all the people I know, myself included, that have started things, it, the bottom line wasn't really the animating factor. It's like, we want to build this thing, like with this show. We want to build a show that's going to be help dads, help families, help young men, and anyone who watches, like, embrace a heroic role for themselves. And how can we reach millions of people? That's what we're in it for. <laughs> yeah. There's a purpose. And then, you know, my friend John Mackey, who's been on the show says, well, you know, profit's just one of the many ways you can measure whether you're on the right track or not. But that's not the motivating force for, for most people that start a thing. It's too hard. It's too likely you're going to fail. Like, yeah. So there's easier ways to make money. Just go be an investment banker or something if that's all you care about. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with investment banking, no. but yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's risking it all for this thing you want to do is not, it's, you're probably going to fail. So, so how did you fail? Did you succeed? How did it go? Well, uh, the real estate business was a, uh, was a roller coaster of a, uh, of a time frame. It had uh, great moments and it had uh, moments when uh, my wife and I are $24 million in contingent debt uh, liability in the 1980s. And right. uh, with the uh, Texas 1980s yep. real estate. Yep. We made it through that. And uh, just real quick for people that aren't banking nerds like me, what was happening in Texas in the 1980s in real estate? Cause I mean, we're, you know, 
I think booms and busts are on everybody's mind right now in 2023. But what was happening then? Well, fundamentally, there was the deregulation of the uh, banking industry by uh, the Reagan administration that opened the door uh, wide. And there was just this boom that uh, went through about 19. 19- uh, 85, and I was in the middle of that and made a— It was the SNLs? Yeah, and I made an ungodly amount of money uh, here in, in Austin. And then uh, I started my uh, uh, second company, uh, real estate development, called uh, Trilogy Development, in 1985 and began to build uh, shopping centers. Uh, and I built three shopping centers here in c- Central Texas. All three failed went into foreclosure. So we battled that, uh, my partners and I, for a few years. And, was uh, there an oil bust, too, that was part the of the backdrop? The oil deal was a factor. Uh, the, the bank failures uh, were a factor. Yeah. Uh, there was just a number of factors that uh, collided uh, at that time. So not, not unlike what we're kind of looking at right now. Yeah. The bank failures happening right now. It actually looks like there's a lot about what's happening now that looks like ni- the 1980s. Yeah. And but you yeah. know we're in Texas, People, we're in Austin, and uh, we're going to be protected somewhat, probably from that. But we'll see. We yeah. don't know. I wouldn't change it for anything. It taught me a number of different, uh, you know, life lessons. Uh, I remember Trisha and I. We, we were married in 1984, uh, and we had bought a home in Westlake Hills. How'd you meet your wife? She was a uh, in her last year uh, at UT, and she was clerking at a law firm uh, that I was a uh, client of. And I'm in there uh, waiting in the waiting room for my meeting, and she's trying to move a five-drawer lateral file cabinet. And me and one of my buddies is in there, and uh, and she asked us if we'll if we'd mule the thing, and bam, you know. <laughs> The principle of reciprocity, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and tight blue jeans. Um, and uh, you know, you, you know, or oh, you were wearing the tight blue jeans. No, yeah. Well, I did it. Yeah, it was Probably the uh, it, was, it was the pressed uh, the pressed uh, Wrangler jeans at the time because yeah. it was the Urban Cowboy days. And um, yeah, and we became tight and uh, married in '84. Bought this house and we had completely redone this house and moved into it in January of 85 and probably around March-ish or so my father and stepmother uh, uh, come up and I am uh, a legit millionaire before I'm 30 years old at at this point in time. I got everything going for me. We're out on this deck overlooking the wild basin drinking a margarita and my dad goes, uh, son, have you paid off your nest? You know, hmm. and I go, what do you mean, Dad? He said, this house, it's your number one responsibility to make sure that your family has a place and always has a place. And um, I launch into a education on leverage <laughs> with my dad. Now, my dad. You don't understand. Is this is a, easy money. It's cheap money. It's like. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I'm explaining this stuff to my dad. My dad is a geophysicist. He is a smart guy and uh, uh, built a b- business himself, was very prolific, downhole well technology in the oil industry. And here I am at 28, 29 years old explaining leverage to him. <laughs> and, uh, and now, How much eye rolling did yeah, he do during this tirade? Uh, I'm sure plenty. <laughs> the real estate business goes to hell in a handbasket. And leverage leverage is a, an axe that has sharp sides on both yeah. sides, right? <laughs> and the loan on my house ended up going into the bad bank because it, it, the loan to value was upside down. And we're paying on this thing for two, three years. I can't remember the time frame. And yeah. uh, one August on renewal, they call me up and they go, we're not going to renew this deal, but we will sell the note to you, a $300,000 note for 150000 bucks." And I go, we don't have a pot to piss in. So guess who I have to call? Daddy. Hmm. And, hey, Dad, uh, I, I baked some humble pie. Yeah. Would you like yeah. to watch me eat it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at some level, it's kind of a pretty good deal if you've got the money. It's like, here you go. We're no. going to uh, devalue he, he the knew, debt, right? He, he knew it was a great deal. He, he, he knew I was learning a lesson. He didn't even have to say anything. 
a beautiful thing to be able to help. But, uh, you know, but out of the ashes, you know, there is a phoenix that can rise. And, you know, that's the wisdom and knowledge of having gone down a road uh, and experience failure because failure is far, far, far more important than success. What was your biggest weakness as a young, successful person? Like, what's your warning to young people who are experiencing success? You know, look, I would just tell people to go find what you love to do and uh, figure out how to do it. Everybody's given this these series of gifts, whatever they are, and that that's who you are and what you are. How do, how do you deploy those gifts? And, and frankly... From a spiritual point of view, how do you deploy those gifts for the betterment of the kingdom? I can tell you that I wasn't into the kingdom much, so I was into Allen, the kingdom of Allen. The hubris is a, is a pretty big deal. When you make the move away from that, that, that's when the world can really change for you. So you have this boom and bust experience. How do you come back to the church? How do you come back to, because you're obviously very... Well, my Deeply wife, connected to your faith. Yeah. How did well, that come about? Yeah, my wife and I are both, uh, you know, I don't like the term workaholic. I don't know exactly uh, what it means. We're very committed parents. and we're, You're doing what you love. Uh, you know, yeah, you never work a day in your life, right? That, that's correct. And, um, and, you know, but we're seven day a week. It's on our minds, no matter what we were doing. Normally, I would go into the office on Sundays. I, I wouldn't go into church. Uh, you know, I'd get up and you know, read the paper and watch the morning news and then go into the office for a couple hours to get things ready for the week. And, you know, one day the door opens up and I'm looking and uh, there she is going out the door with a couple of kids all dressed up. I don't remember how many at the time. There's five total now. She's going to mass. And I look at that and uh, and I'm going, the, the train is leaving the station and I'm I'm not hooked up to that train. And if, if I'm going to be the dad that my dad was not, uh, I've got to do something about this. But I wasn't very happy about it. So that's interesting. So what, what, if you weren't happy about it, what was it that you, what was the draw? What was the draw? Uh, that I had to be there. In to, order to be with your family? Be or? with the family. Yeah. Yeah. So I made the decision, you know, because most people aren't catechized very well as kids. No matter what faith you grow up in, you're just accepting what your parents are dishing out to you. And so even though I went to uh, Catholic grade school and did all the things. Got all the sacraments and all that all stuff. All that stuff. Uh, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really sink in. I mean, the funny thing for the non-Catholic that's, that hasn't had a lot of exposure to Catholicism has got a lot of ornaments. It's got We've got these sacraments and all these different things, and there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's not just like oh, accept Christ into your heart and you're reborn. No, nah, no, nah, 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 no, nah, no. Nah. We nah. got a, we got a whole mul a lot of steps. We got a lot of s rituals. We got this mass that never has very good music. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the real hardcore Catholics don't even like the homily. So if you think you're going to get a great a great preacher giving yeah. you a bunch of wisdom every probably Sunday, probably won't. Yeah, probably not here. Yeah, um, yeah. It's so, kind of a demanding religion in that it is. way. It is. <laughs> uh, but uh, to me, uh, the liturgical movement of the Mass is uh, the most settling environment that you can be in when you understand what is going on. And that's a missing link, in my humble opinion, for non-liturgical folks. I decide that, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to go. Uh but I need to I need to bone up on this deal, and so I, I go to the bookstore and I buy a couple of books, and I'm reading, and I get enamored with this deal, and I read really? more. Yeah, and what what about what's enamoring at that? There's a lot of things that were enamoring to me from the top line. What an incredible, unbelievable train wreck this deal is. The whole mean? deal. I've heard you say this in other interviews and films and things. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the Catholic Church is a train wreck can trigger a lot of different thoughts for people. What well, are yours? All of all of Christianity is a train wreck. The whole the whole shooting match and the mothership of that deal and the leader of the train wreck and the engine that pulls everybody else behind it is the Roman Catholic Church. Period. 
it's managed by man, and yeah. man is extraordinarily flawed. So uh, you have the heresies, you have the schisms, you have the w wars, you have the murders, you have the mayhems, you have the reformations, you have the sex scandals and the this thing and the that yeah. thing and uh, and the popes getting married and the money thing and the power thing. And they had armies until they stripped the Vatican of its army in, in the mid-1800s. And you start yeah, looking. You just read about like we just got back from some time in Italy and it's like the Medici's and the relation and the church and the pope and the bishops. And it's like. It's all crazy. It, no. None of it makes sense if you're thinking like religions about God and or and about your soul. No, and, and, <laughs> it's yeah. like, it and seems so, like a bunch of power plays and a bunch of like weird medieval kingdom fighting on earth stuff. Yeah, and you know, and even in the Protestant denominations, they've divided into about sixty billion uh, denominations, and the nucleus of that deal remains completely intact. And I find that incredulous, 2,000 years, that the, the idea of Jesus the Christ, that God sent his only son, born of a virgin, you know, little girl, 14 years old, impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit through the message of an angel and, you know, the death, the resurrection, the passion, all of this stuff is, is incredulous. That the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, and boom, 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 boom. That is intact. For all of us, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, all of that. To me, it's an incredible uh, journey. And so intellectually, I got into that. And, and I had this very intellectual relationship with, uh, with Christ. Because there are things that one, by faith alone, must believe that are incredulous things, all those things I just named. But then in 1996, I got invited to go on a men's retreat at my parish, St. John Newman Catholic Church, where had I known that men were going to hold hands and pray and, God forbid, do that bromance, hugging it out, <laughs> I'd, I'd have never gone. That was not my spirituality. I was going to learn more about my Catholic faith and honestly, to network with high net worth Catholic men. That's why I was going. St. John Newman is in the middle of Westlake Hills. Yeah, well, wealthy parish, wealthy, wealthy, parish, na wealthy neighborhood, good wealthy place. neighborhood. I'm, yep. a, you know, I want to be wealthy. You know, that's why I I'll show up. I'll get coffee. What are you working on? I yeah. got a deal. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> it's a little. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Jesus is going to come in here and flip over the tables, so let's keep talking. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. 30 hours later, uh, this intellectual relationship dropped a complete floor into the depths of the cave of my heart. So let, let paint the picture for this. So you you go to this men's retreat. What is, is this like the Knights Christ of Columbus? Christ Renews His pa Parish. Okay. Chirp for short. So what's happening there that has, that's transformation? Uh, there are, um, it's a 30 hour program basically. And there are, uh, 10 testimonies, witnesses right out off the bat. This guy would get up in front. There were probably 70, 80 guys in this room, small room. You're crowded in there. He begins to vomit out stuff where, you know, I want to go up and go, Hey, bro. Honestly, some things need to be held and kept deeply in the back corner recesses of your skeleton closet. I don't need to hear this. We got the, this whole res confession booth. Yeah, you go do off. that. Yeah, and just do it uh, privately. Uh, th these are not things that I want to hear. But then he would connect them to uh, forgiveness, healing, reconciliation, and redemption. And then there'd be another witness and another witness over this 30 hour period, 10 of these things. And by the end of this deal, I was looking at myself as the flawed uh, human uh, that, that I am, uh, the hubris being stripped away, realizing that all the crapola that they're vomiting out from their skeleton closet is sitting inside this skeleton closet. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm like re renewed. Uh, in a very powerful way. And I come home that night and, you know, I'm like the, the chatterbox and I'm not the chatterbox at home. And Trisha's going, wow, something's happened. Wonder if this is going to be sustained. And uh, 
anyway, it was, uh, it was, it was powerful. And, and I began to ask God, what do you want me to do? I wasn't asking God to get me out of my, my real estate gig was starting to go. This is 1996. Yeah, so so it's I'm, picking I'm, on, up. I'm on the upswing on this deal. I'm headed to where I thought, uh, you know, I was ultimately going to be. And I, I was just asking God, look, I'll become a Knight of Columbus. I'll, I'll be a lector or Eucharistic minister or sacristan or, you know, I'll, you know, cook some barbecue on Sundays. Uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. What can I give? Uh, yeah, what can I give? But ultimately, it led to a series of things that led to the founding of Mobilos and Fishes. So, so th- thank th- God. It's the mid nineties. Yeah. Is there a homelessness problem at that point in Austin that is part of the community conversation? Like what was the situation in the city at the time when it comes to homelessness? Uh, there was a growing population that nothing compared to what we were, we're seeing uh, today, but it was a burgeoning and fairly prevalent, prevalent, uh, panhandling on the street corners, uh, you know, a few smatterings up underneath bridges and stuff like that, but not to the overwhelming thing that we currently see. What's the first thing you do to that brings you into engaging with folks that are on the street? In 97, I was asked by our parish uh, uh, Catholic Charities in Austin w- was a very nascent uh, operation, a priest and a volunteer guy running it in the basement of the bishop's house. And uh, they were trying to put a program together called the SAC Lunch Program, Social Assistance Christian Kitchens, hmm. that five days a week uh, would take 50 SAC meals uh, to the day labor camp downtown, day labor site downtown, so that 50 people that would get a job that day would have a lunch that they could take with them. And they had asked St. John Newman if they would participate. And St. John Newman said, let me check. And they, by 1997, uh, they, they came and picked on me and said, would you, would you lead this for us? And I said, sure, let me go, you know, talk to those. So I went and met with those guys, Father Jim Evans, a, uh, a uh, Episcopal convert, Roman Catholic married priest, uh, was kind of running the thing. And I met with him and another guy. You know, they, they moved a lot slower, uh, you know, so I don't know if this is narcissism or leadership. Uh, <laughs> but I, I came in and said, let me, let me really dive into this deal hard. And, and we collectively put together uh, five communities, uh, uh, both Protestant and Catholic, that every day of the week, five days a week, would prepare. And St. John Newman, uh, day to deliver, uh, was Wednesday. So every Tuesday night, a, a group of volunteer parishioners would come in, uh, prepare uh, these sack lunches, and then on Wednesday, they would be delivered by a volunteer downtown. So this is marching along. And so this is my introduction somewhat into this deal. Yeah. And I, I found it interesting. I found it interesting because people wanted to volunteer uh, to do things. And then in the spring of 1998, my wife and I are having coffee with a girlfriend of ours. The girlfriend is telling us about a ministry in Corpus Christi where on cold winter nights, multiple churches would come together, pool their resources to take out to the men and women that were living on the streets of Corpus on these cold nights. And look, at that moment, the image of a catering truck, or what many of us affectionately call a roach coach, comes out of my subconscious mind into my conscious mind as a distribution mechanism from those of us who have abundance to those that lack. And as a serial entrepreneur that I am, uh, I thought it was a brilliant idea like every idea that we have. <laughs> and uh, I didn't share the idea at that time. Uh, my wife, who was married to a serial entrepreneur, and I've taken her up and down that roller coaster. At some point in time, a week or two later, I finally got the courage to share it with her. 
she just looks at me and goes, oh my God, here we go again. So give me the pitch. I'm your wife. What's your idea? There's not much of a pitch, really. I just babe, I got this idea that we could go out and buy a gently used uh, catering truck, a roach coach. I'd probably already looked something up on the internet. Uh, internet's pretty new, you know, at that time. And um, I'm thinking that we could go buy a truck and go out on the streets on cold winter nights. It was that, that simple. Um, she knows that when I get on point, there's no, yeah, there's no diverting me. She, that's just, yeah. You're a dog with a bone. I'm a dog with the bone. Yeah. And then, um, in that post chirp experience, I'm called to lead other men on their chirp experience. And so I'm a spiritual director now leading a group of men through their retreat like I was led. And at the end of these Sunday night meetings, uh, many people descend into the parking lot and they're just hanging out there and they're talking their spirituality with other men. It, it's beautiful. And I'm sitting there with a brother of mine, Bruce Agnes, and I go, man, I've got this crazy idea. You know, we go buy a roach coach, 1500 bucks, uh, you know, put some TLC into it and we start feeding people on the streets. And he looks at me and he goes, I'll put 500 in that deal. And I go, I I'll match it. So All right. there, there it was. The there it begins. Yeah, there it begins. And, uh, and now, this year, 25 years later, because it was this, this time of year, 1998, that that idea came up. How about that? And we went out on the streets on September 13th, 1998, in the back of a green minivan to see if five white guys could do this from Westlake Hills. And on September 13th of 2023, I am going to step on the Camino de Santiago and walk 500 miles in pilgrimage to the Basilica of Santiago, St. James, where the bones of the Apostle St. James are buried in thanksgiving to God for 25 years. I don't know how. I don't know how we got here. You're going to ask me all these things, how, 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 but at the end of the day, I, don't, I really don't know. So you get in this roach coach. What's the first What's the first moments like? What's the what's the biggest surprise? Because obviously people are going to be grateful, mostly, right, to get food who are out in the street and hungry and lacking. But what's the surprise? The relationship. Uh, we went out there to transactionally do something. We're going to feed people. And uh, that's not all what we do. We leverage food in that context to connect human to human, heart to heart. Turns out that food is the number one connector between you and I as people. We have our little coffee here, so we're enjoying our time together. Your first date with your spouse, I'm sure yeah, was noodle, food. Noodle shop on 40, 44th Street in Broadway. Yeah, uh, Jefferies for my wife and I uh, on West Lynn. This is how we continue to connect, is through food. Everything else is very secondary. Sex is way down the line, you know. Well, food definitely comes first. Food yeah. and sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you can't get to sex if you don't have those two. No, that was the biggest uh, deal. And, and, and you begin to break down the stereotypes of your perception of who these men and women are and begin to learn something very deep and meaningful. So when do you call this? Enterprise mobile mobile loaves and fishes. Oh, right away. Right away. Yeah, right away. I was uh, searching the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes uh, stuck with me. Yeah. It's the only miracle outside the resurrection that appears in all four gospels, and actually appears six different times. There's a lot that you can read in um, theologically into that miracle, especially in John chapter six, when it's a nameless little boy that offers up the five barley loaves and two fish, nameless little boy offering up everything that he has to God uh, to bless it and multiply it. And it continues to resonate to this day. What seems to be the case is that below all the safety nets that the government at the federal, state and local level have, there's a fabric of, um, of overwhelmingly faith-based organizations. 
that's a tighter fabric than any of that bureaucracy. It is striking that almost all of these groups, yours, yours included, are driven by faith to go to the people at the absolute bottom, at the absolute margin of society, and devote themselves to lifting those people up. What's your explanation for that? Every Sunday there's a gospel reading, a New Testament reading, and an Old Testament reading. Every Sunday. And every three years you're going to journey through the entire uh, three-year cycle of Scripture from Genesis chapter 1 to the end of Revelations. And the gospel is central uh, to that. The liturgy of the Word, it's Old Testament, New Testament, uh, gospel uh, reading. And you are hammered with this every Sunday. I think it is just embedded into our fundamental Christian DNA. And so and what is being embedded that says go out there and serve? I mean, from your perspective, it's like, a, well, uh, go out the, there and serve. The go people. and do end up being relegated to very few. How do you mean? Very few are going to answer that call. Most of us are followers. You and I are followers of Jesus Christ. We didn't lead the deal. So right. we're, we're following. Uh, I've answered a call that is a very small piece of the kingdom work that's out there. And, and people are following that call. So I can be seen as a leader in that deal because I'm going and doing, but most people uh, aren't. And so uh, that I, I got that call. I got that call hard, and uh, people began to follow. So I think I can connect us back now to where we started our conversation. You have mobile loaves and fishes, these carts. You have a background in real estate. Yeah. You've got this calling to help and to help as many people, pr presumably, as you possibly can. Yeah. Wh wh where does the permanent community now happen. Yeah. So what brings us to what becomes community first village. But in May of 2003, uh, 15 of us from St. So John Newman, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, go out and spend 72 hours on the streets. We leave on a Friday that uh, dropped off downtown with backpacks and, uh, were picked up 72 hours later. Yeah. What was the idea here? What, what was like, Hey, you know what we need to do? We need to do this uh, in a in a very simple way. It was a sleepover. It's a kindergarten, first grade sleepover with their friends, and going into their home, which was the Wallace Streets of downtown Austin. Initially, you would say that we were there to uh, experience homelessness. We we learned on that retreat that that is not ever possible. You cannot experience something that is, is not completely lived. It's that simple. And so it really became a retreat environment, just like the chirp retreat or any other silent retreat that you might go on with our retreat center being the Wallace streets of downtown Austin. And we would jump into that river with no rudder and we would be taken wherever God was going to take us. And that became very profound. So what was intimately being developed from the truck, those that were serving and those being served were on the same side of the serving counter. And it required a one-on-one -on -one connection. Hey, my name's Alan. Yep. Yeah. And so if I went out the next time on a truck run and I saw you and I remembered your name and I called your name out and you happened to remember mine and called my name out in return, Oh, man, we have created something, you know, and that's what was building. And then now we're spending the night on the streets, and you're taking me to your places. You're taking me to your living room where you get coffee, where you're going to get breakfast the next morning, where the free stuff is, where the safest places are to, to sleep. This is my life. This is where I'm at. Th th that's Let correct. me show you how this yeah. life works. Yeah. And when I talked about the vomit in the men's retreat, the homeless uh, population, there are men and women that are extremely transparently vulnerable. They will tell you everything. Oh, yeah, I'm a crack addict. Uh, you know, my father used to rape me and 
you know, I mean, you just, oh, oh my yeah. God. And, yeah. um, and so uh, you end up in these pretty deep, intimate relationships, and, and that's where our philosophy of the single greatest cause being a profound, catastrophic loss of family began to grow. There's also this giant question mark of why in the most abundant country in the history of the universe ever yeah. that we're aware of are people living on the streets. And in 2005, I got this idea to go and uh, buy a gently used recreational vehicle. And uh, we went and bought one, lifted one guy off. That guy lives with us to this day. And at that point, as a real estate developer, I started yeah. dreaming about building an RV park. That wasn't a large stretch. How far outside of uh, town is Community First? From the University of Texas, uh, it's about seven and a half miles. Yeah, it's not far. No. That's one of the things that's neat about Austin as a city relative to, say, New York, which is where I lived before, which is you don't have to go that far to get to relatively abundant land that's not astronomically expensive, even even in 2023. Yeah, uh, honestly, bro, it, that's everywhere almost. New York's pretty tough. Jersey, well, you got to get to, like, like yeah, affordable no, land outside of New York is called Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, but affordable land is, uh, to me, I mean, that's almost an oxymoron. Uh, we live in a multi tree I mean, our two new phases that we're yeah. under development on right now is a $200 million project. Yeah, that's not nothing. That's no, it that's, is that's, nothing. That's, that... It's actually nothing. It's close to nothing. In the context of a multi-trillion dollar economy. Yeah, well, sure. Uh, Fair enough. It's, 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 it's not much. And you, you have to put it into context. And we, we, as humans, take things too personally. And we don't think uh, from a global uh, perspective. Now, $200 million to you and I? Yeah. yeah. I, I got it. I see the shock and awe to that number. But it is literally a pathetic amount of money in the scheme of the economy that we live in. Well, when I look at um, cities like Seattle and um, San Francisco in particular that seem to have pursued policies that objectively by their own measures have not worked, they spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on programs that don't seem to work. They might, they do help individuals at some level, but they also seem to perpetuate a lot of a lot of problems and build bureaucracies and all this other stuff. So how are you um, deploying that trivial amount of money by by the economy standards differently than Seattle or San Francisco? How do you think about that? You know, Mobile Loaves and Fishes wants to be a truth teller. So we want people to be confronted with the brutal facts. And if you believe, like we do, that the single greatest cause is a profound, catastrophic loss of family up here yeah. at the top of this river, that's where you get in that river, that uncontrollable river where you are completely rudderless. You're in it, and you encounter the foster care system. It's a broken train wreck. You encounter drugs and alcohol. It's a broken train wreck. You encounter the criminal justice system. It's a broken train wreck. You encounter our pathetic education system, the way that it's unfolded today. It is a train wreck. The mental health system, the physical health care system. And we're down here at these level five rapids, you know, after people have been flowing out. And we're fishing people out of that river. We're doing nothing up here to transform what's going on in our culture. So in a lot of ways, we are putting a Band-Aid on a carotid artery bleed. It's necessary. It's necessary to feed people. It's necessary to give them the best health care that we possibly can. It's necessary to fish them out of that for a variety of reasons and allow them this opportunity to settle. But we're not fixing this thing up, up here. And that is singularly the failure. And if I could do anything in the world while we're fishing people out down here is get us back onto a track where we recognize how valuable the family and the forged family is to the success of humanity. 
yourself. How do you think about the role of dad at the top of this river that flows down to people suffering from homelessness and, and catastrophic collapse of their lives? I mean, you look at the family at the core, fathers play a really important role in that. If we could manage to bring dads back into the picture and close this gap, is there a bigger thing, in your opinion, to do at the top of the river than that? We're not going to be, be able to say singularly it, it is the key, and I'll try to explain why, but I believe it is a big piece of that puzzle. Seventy-something percent of all live African-American births are to a single mother. About 50 percent of white and 50 percent of Hispanic to a single mom, and growing by the way. Right. These are cataclysmic uh, uh, train wrecks, it, n no doubt about it. But even within our intact families, we put our families onto the escalator of brokenness from the very beginning. We want our children to have the finest education on the face of the planet. We now place children in elementary school in advanced mathematics and advanced English, thinking that we're doing them well. And we're not. <laughs> we, we are pushing them up this escalator. And when they graduate from high school, in my Westlake experience, we want our children to go off to the finest colleges that money can possibly buy. And we send them far away. We used to not do this. They used to all be here and local. We send them off, you know, to New York, to Boston, you know, to Indiana. And our children are doing what it is that we wanted them to do. They're going to get the finest education that they possibly can. And then we are asking them to go get the highest paid jobs that they possibly can and earn all the money. And suddenly we find our children working for Amazon and Microsoft up in Seattle, Washington, while we're down here in uh, Austin, Texas. What's wrong with this picture so far? Profound, catastrophic loss of family. So now you're going to meet and marry somebody up there in Seattle, Washington. You're going to procreate. And you're going to start having grandkids. If you're lucky, you might get to see your children twice a year. And your grandchildren will never know you. And this is what we do. This is what we do as Americans. This is anthropologically never really ever been done. So it's actually quite painful to hear this for me because I moved, I never saw myself leaving the Northeast. So my whole family is Italian American and they all basically lived in South Philadelphia, like a little Italian ghetto in Philly. My parents uh, met in the, down the beach at the shore, Jersey shore, but their parents lived close by. When my mom and dad married, and moved just like 45 minutes outside the city. My mom acted like my dad was moving her to the other side of the planet because they, she grew up in a, in a neighborhood environment where her grandmother and aunts and uncles were right there at the corner store. And so I experienced this thing firsthand, like most of us have now. I went away to Penn State, which was still in state, but it was three hours away. So I kind of got inculcated in not seeing my parents that often. And then I moved to New York City and worked in television for over a decade and I saw my folks not as not, not that frequent frequently but not that frequently and then the lifestyle there was so difficult and the commuting and the 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 way it it kind of broke me that we moved here to Austin to try to have a better life for ourselves and every aspect of life has improved with that move except I'm now a flight away from my parents and it's this sort of broken part of me they're still alive they're still alive how, how old are they my parents are pretty young. My mom's just turning 70. And my dad's three years younger than my mom. So he's 67. Okay, but let's, let's say that uh, you're lucky and you got him for another 20 years. You see him twice a year. Let's say it's three yeah, times. Yeah, three, four times. Yeah. You got 60, 70 more times that you're going to see your parents. Yeah. Um, so I hate to throw that in, but this is, this is the reality of what, what you're trying to make me cry here, Alan. What we have, <laughs> no, this is what we have culturally done. Yeah. I, I'm, what yeah. I'm trying to make the point that we can look at the people up underneath the bridges and on our street corners as being homeless, but we are missing the point of what homeless is really all about. 
And some of the most homeless people that I've ever met in my life had live in the most extraordinary houses that you could ever possibly build. Let's not be confused by what's going on in this country. And the same thing can happen to your children, where they're going to go and do, they're going to get on this escalator that we put them on. It's a radical critique, and it's something that I have um, struggled with and care and have, have brought my focus on more now than I, than I used to. I'm 45 years old. My son's about to turn 18. So he's, uh, we're thinking about college and whatnot. And I would even dare say, and I'm a big capitalist, that it's a quirk of freedom, not just capitalism, because capitalism is just the free enterprise. It's just freedom. It's just, I can, we can do whatever we want so long as we don't hurt each other. That's capitalism. So freedom, it has this cost. No, it does. This is a genuine cost. Yeah. No. It's not all benefit to be this mobile. You're hitting on some extremely interesting conversations. Our constitution is is an impediment to family because everything is focused on individual rights. I'm pro constitution, by the way. Yeah, sure. But uh, when everything is focused on the individual rights over and above the rights of the community, which is where we have navigated to over the past several generations. It's an erosion of the rights of the community in order for the rights of the individual uh, to be at the most. It's, It's a complex conversation, but it's one that we should be compelled to have. It's the same conversation if you do the math on how many times you're going to see your parents before they die. It, it, and look, uh, mom can have the big one day after tomorrow, and you're not even there. And this isn't a guilt trip. We no, all it, it's, live in this. It's the reality of what the escalator that we are putting. And, and it's even becoming more distant. Your mom just moved 45 minutes away. For the t- decades that remained of me living at home, this was the fight in our house. It's almost regularly, you moved me away from my family. <laughs> and I mean, like, it's 40, it was a 45-minute drive. Like, yeah. my commute every day to and from our house in, in New Jersey into Manhattan was double, at a minimum, what my, how long it would take for my parents in Allentown to go visit South Philly and see my well, grandparents. Well, there's a Bedouin community outside of uh, Israel. Uh, they live in tents. And it is possible and probable that a 8- or 10-year-old child could be sitting on the lap of their great, great, great grandparent. Five generations in the same household. Anthropologically, man, biblically, yeah. all, all of that stuff gets connected. Elon Musk was asked recently what he thought the greatest catastrophe that was looming ahead. They're, they're thinking climate change. If you, if, any, if you know anything about the research, that's not the case yet. It's population. Yeah. It's population. There's a book written by a guy. I can't think of the name of it right now. It's uh, a former guy from Stratfor. And, uh, yeah, Peter Zahan. Uh, yeah. That's him. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the truth. We as Americans are in decent shape because we're a country of immigrants, and we're going to import the, the things that we need. But China and Europe are in a dire mess, and, and we're going to get to see that in our lifetime. I want to share something. So I, we just went, spent two weeks in Italy. Um, so we were there for Holy Week, for Easter, which was amazing because we're in this little Sicilian town of Noto on Easter Sunday, and they've got a procession and this like beautiful statue of Jesus is being hauled through the street, and everybody's old who's playing the instruments, but it was amazing. I'm still processing the lessons of spending these two weeks, the three of us as a family, we only we have one son, together. It's difficult because one of the things about Italy, especially as a Catholic and as an Italian Catholic, is you have this connection to antiquity because the antiquity is everywhere. So you feel the physical building component of a multi-generational existence. There it is. Here we are at this church, and it's a thousand years old. And in these smaller towns, you have a sense of what a, a good life, the La, La Dolce Vita, looks like, sort of. But even in even there, 
they're not having kids. Those towns are sort of economically a disaster. So you have this, like, it's like a shadow of a part of the human experience that we have turned our backs on, but that we go to visit for vacation and is deeply enriching. <laughs> we go to visit this former life and it's like, wow, I feel renewed. That's what, I feel like there's an answer in that. And then we come home and um, slowly that becomes a memory and we're back to it. And I don't know how to process this because it's like, I don't really know what the answer is. We're off in the beaten track a little bit, but we're up at the top of the, the headwaters of this stream. Is it just about inculcating in our families to stay together and to stay close and to stay connected? You forget that the societal level, just at the individual level, what do we do? I'm, I'm an entrepreneurial capitalist to the core. At what cost are we willing to break up our families and our communities for that philosophy? And so that's... Uh, that's complicated. It used to be the case that the only way you could pursue certain careers was to move to a city far away probably from your town because that's where the industry was. That's where you were going to, like, I, 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 went to film and, I went to film school, so I was going to move to Los Angeles or New York if I wanted to be in the big time. And it seems like for more and more jobs, that's not true. I don't need to necessarily leave my hometown if I like it and if I want to be there and if, I've got, if those values have resonated with me as a young person that I want to stay close to my family. You could do it now more than you ever could before. And I wonder if this is an opportunity that's being like the technology and the freedom and the progress that has driven a truck through our lives of our multi-generational lives. Is it, is it a chance that we could back that truck up with new tech and say, now we can have a multi-generational dynasty of a family. And yeah, you can be a tech entrepreneur and you, you can be an artist and a musician and we can still live in this town together and see each other for, for Sunday evening dinners and go to the basketball games of our great grandkids and, and yet experience our potential, the things we wanna to try to achieve that are our potential and that are out there calling us to do things. That'll be an interesting uh, evolution to, to watch. I live in the community, I work in the community. Uh, I wake up, we have 90 something employees. I'm engaging with them every single day in, in a community that is vibrant. I, I don't know how people can work out of their house. I'm sure they're thinking on the other end of the deal. Yeah. Maybe I can't, I can't do it. I, I, uh, need to, I need to come to a place. And that's so I want to see, you know, <laughs> the anthropological evolution of that. So I'm going to I'm going to hold on to the nugget that the technology might be able to drive people closer. But uh, it's hard. I don't see it. So you've built this community together with your the, your team and your and your staff and the folks that have donated to your efforts. What kind of transformations have you seen in the, in the people that live there? And is it meant to be permanent or is it a stop on a journey? Do you want them to ultimately leave? Uh, I mean, I, I would think you do. I, I do, but the ultimate uh, journey will be heaven. So I want them to die here in our community. It's where I want to die. It's, death is the most incredible experience in this community. If you die in this community, if we know that you're dying or you have died, there will be a hundred people outside of your home until that body is removed. It's incredible. Never seen anything like it. Every time, 22 people died last year, probably nine or 10 or have passed away this year so far. It's an incredibly moving, beautiful experience. If you, Give us the rights to your body. We will cremate you for free and inter your remains on that property with your name etched in granite in a columbarium that's at the center of the property. Yeah, so the journey is from here to there, whatever there is. Actually, sure. I think there is right here. We just can't figure it out. Yeah, It's not like it's in the Andromeda galaxy. That's right, not where right. heaven is. It's right here. Just like the, the Celtics believed in the uh, the thin place you know it's that very porous place that you enter sometimes you kind of talk about it in this little italian uh, town where there's this uh, porous connection between heaven and 
in earth. You know, you, you experience something there. When you come into the village, what I experience is that very porous place, that thin place that connects me more than any place else on the planet between what heaven is like and, and what the reality of earth is. So my goal is for uh, people to be able to settle here. Settle means not moving. So you're tr you are trying to provide genuinely, and you are providing, it sounds like, homes. Yeah. Not housing. Well, your mother got unsettled 45 minutes away from home. Right. She never, the home was not over here. I think she's still ultimately, there's a, it doesn't feel fully settled. It's just a, well, and that, it's, that's, it's, it's that hard head Sicilian thing too. So she's well, like, nah. <laughs> yeah, well, it may, it may be just wired uh, anthropological thing. Yeah. You know, she got. I mean, that's a radical and kind of controversial vision because your peers that try to serve others that are suffering like this, or whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous or other programs that work with the homeless, the Salvation Army, et cetera, that they're trying to put themselves out of business, that in the best case scenario, they're trying to solve a problem for people and get people on and up and out and into the world and you are on the street and now you're an investment banker with a wife and kids and that's what success looks like. That's not what you're saying, which is radical. A friend of mine did a, a movie called Happiness Is and uh, it starred uh, Willie Nelson, John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, Matthew Dowd, the Dalai Lama, and Alan Graham. <laughs> In there, I make this comment that our children should be our 401k. We certainly invest them in them in them a whole heck of a lot in their early Well, in never before years. in history have we ever done what we're doing today, where we're saving up all this money, and then you and I get warehoused in some assisted living old folks' uh, home at the end of the day, living off of the money that we had to save in order to be able to do that. That that's never happened. Even like the financial markets are based on this, like the totally. savings that fund the capital that when you go and get a bank loan, you are borrowing your grand somebody's grandparents' money. Yeah. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You as a young person, you're a new homeowner, you go to the bank, you get a loan to buy your house. That is somebody else's grandparents' retirement funds that you are borrowing. Yeah. And that the, and that your interest is partially paying somebody yeah. else's grandparents' all, all, all fixed I'm, income. Yeah, all I'm trying to do is go uh, we need to look at this from a different perspective and marinate on the impact that it's having. I'm not yeah. lay, laying out the answers to this deal. I'm just, I'm just saying there is a negative collateral impact to what we are doing today. And we're seeing the fruits of that devastation unfold right before our eyes. And you can see it in the woundedness of our society up underneath our bridges and on our street corners. That's the greatest manifestation of the festering boil uh, on our culture. All along the way, there's many other issues. There's our culture of death, the lack of caring for each other from the moment you were conceived to the moment that you naturally uh, die in this deal and everything in, in between. And it becomes radical thinking because we have become so uh, individually minded thinking, uh, hyper individualism. You know, I've got a, uh, a, uh, a piece that I carry around with me everywhere I go that, uh, that describes, uh, you know, what we're faced with. And, uh, by the way, that is a Rome, Italy intersection, <laughs> uh, a roundabout that, uh, you're crazy as an American to drive through that into a Roman roundabout. But these are the roadways that are entering in and the, yeah. the profound catastrophic loss of family being the big one. But you see hyper-individual is one of those uh, deals. You can have that. Uh, I, I, I really like this. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think one of the things that's become so hard, I feel like, and maybe it's just a function of maturity, is that we have to somehow hold a lot of different, often contradictory values together in our mind and in our lives, like that individual freedom is essential because how am I going to discover what I'm capable of if I don't have the freedom to go out and try? And yet 
there is this cost. If I don't have any other value but me pursuing my own inside my head exploration of the world with no regard for becoming enmeshed with others, that I'm not necessarily going to end up very happy. I might... I could be at the top of a mountain alone, and solitary confinement is torture for people in prison. Well, I'll give you an example of where our, in my humble opinion, where our individual rights have gone awry. If you contract cancer or heart problem or diabetes, you, you get to go to your doctor, and you get to make decisions with your doctor and your family about what your treatment protocols are, are going to be. In the mental health world, it's the same thing. When you become or are diagnosed mentally ill, say a paranoid schizophrenic, and you don't have the cognitive capability to actually make decisions, you still have the right, civil right, to make that decision. That alone has caused a problem, a great documentary called God Knows Where I Am, beautiful piece done as a result of a woman uh, who suffered mental illness and died mentally ill with her civil rights intact while her daughter and her sister were struggling to try to rescue her and get her the help that she needs, but the woman refused. This feels like it's, at, it's, it's one of these really challenging because I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but because of the work that I've, I've done with films to try to, and, and interviews like the, and conversations like this, I've gotten a hint that there's been this legal transformation that started really, I, I guess, under JFK, because I always hear this, oh, Reagan, Reagan shut down all the institutions, no, look, but I, I think it was actually JFK that did that. No, that well, it started with JFK, and then the exclamation point came with Reagan, and it was a phenomenal move on both parts. Uh, so can you just explain what happened? Did, like, it, sense, it was like, really deinstitutionalizing the mental health institutions, recognizing that... Uh, People should actually be able to live in community. And they were right, uh, and I'm making up a number, 95% of the time. So 95% of the people that were living in these institutions. These state-run things. These state-run deals. Nurse, were, ra nurse ratchet type experiences. Those experiences were completely capable of living in community under some level of yeah. uh, guidance and supervision. And it was beautiful. 5% were not. And we have not found a way to rebalance yet. And legally. we have not found that rebalancing act. And that 5% are the ones that are standing on our street corner screaming at us. So, uh, so, and uh, in order to help mitigate the pain of their mental health issue, they're smoking crack. Uh, self medicating, basically. Self medicating on top of the psychotropic drugs that they may be on if they're on those. Very complex. Uh, so, a couple of years ago here in Austin, a law was. I guess it was a law that was passed by the city council that um, removed what was a ban on camping on public grounds, on the sidewalks and et cetera, and basically moved that from being illegal and the cops could come and move you and say, no, you can't do this, to saying, no, they're not going to act. And almost overnight, many parts of the city saw explosions of like tent cities. And, th and then... To fast forward, I think it was last summer or the summer before, uh, a, a sort of public-led initiative reinstated that, that ban. I don't know how to think about it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like compassion to just let people live on the sidewalk and, 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 and turn into these sort of diseased favelas that have like the typhus and crazy things that start to happen and rape and murder. And, but at the same time, like from a compassion perspective, just saying, well, you can do all of that, but just do it down in the ditch where no one can see it also feels not like a solution. How do you think about that? How do you think about what's happened here in this city? Because it's, it's been replicated elsewhere. We're not going to ever make any progress criminalizing the issue of homelessness. Converse to that, the decriminalization of that had the impact that it had. Uh, the famous congressman that uh, passed away recently, John Lewis, 
when people would bring legislation uh, to him, would always ask a simple question. Who, who does this hurt? If you want my support for this legislation, I want to understand who this is going to hurt because every piece of legislation is going to hurt somewhat. And so when you undid the ordinances and people could go wherever they wanted, it, yeah. it was hurting a lot of people. There was a lot of help that was happening to the homeless population. They were actually safer the more visible they were versus hidden in the yeah. woods because when they shut that deal down, there yeah. was a giant camp of 100 people right here. And uh, they all went there hidden. We were not prepared on either side, but it's complicated. Uh, I understand both sides of the equation. We don't want to see that. We don't want them in our, the front door of our businesses. We don't want them at the front door of our neighborhoods, these tent encampments. There's fear, and then there's the reality of fear. The probability that anybody is going to be attacked by a homeless person is probably the lowest ever. They're not the marauders of our community. Yeah, I think that's fair. It, that's factual. Uh, but if you are a paranoid schizophrenic having delusions while you're smoking meth uh, on a street corner and yeah. you're yelling at someone that you're going to come and get them, it's a frightening deal. Okay. I, I, we see it every day. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're on the front lines of this. We're on the front lines, and that's not where the violence uh, is. Now, they may steal your car stereo or your kid's bicycle. These are things that we don't want, but let's not get too attached to our stuff when people are starving and living in complete filth on our street corners. When we focus on the work you're doing with Community First Village, explain just what it is, what happens, what do they have access to, how does this um, experience unfold for them, practically speaking? So, I, like, I'm on the street. You come up to me. What, come, what happens? Walk me through the experience. Depending on the housing type that you want to get in, you want to get into a micro home, it's going to take you three to four months. Are you going to build me one, or there's probably going to be one that becomes available? No, that one will become available. You're on a list uh, with 180 other people. What am I doing while I wait? You're living under the bridge. Okay. Or wherever you're living. Theoretically and legally, you can't go and move into a hotel room. What does that mean, legally, I can't move into a hotel room? Our, our definition of serving the chronically homeless people is an important definition from a legal point of view that limits our ability to rent to anybody else other than the chronically homeless. And, and if you move into a hotel room, you cease to be chronically homeless. This is a federal fair housing yeah. issue. It's more complex. I'm going to just give the simple answer. Why do you have to pay any attention to that? If you bought the land, it's your land. Why can't you just do what you want? Oh, you just can't. Uh, we live in the United States of America. You just can't do anything that you want to do. But I mean, I'm, I'm asking that seriously, though. So is it because do you get some funding from the, like HUD that that comes with strings attached? How, why is it that no, that it's, rule it's, it's, it's not any, to it's you? It's not any different than um, you get your driver's license and you just can't go out and drive 180 miles an hour on the highway. I want to push on this a little bit because I want to make sure I understand it because that I'm getting on a highway, there's other people. You're taking a housing unit away from somebody else. So in a, in a country where uh, we should have equal access, equally, all of us. So if I, if I can get temporary, a temporary buffer, because I know this is coming, I, disqual okay. I disqualify myself by improving my situation while I wait. Correct. That seems super weird and kind of like a corrupt situation if, if you go if you me. if you go from the streets into a uh, recovery program where you're recovering from the use of drugs and alcohol and you spend which seems like a pretty good place to start before I move into a community that that's correct yeah I I disqualify myself you disqualify yourself 
Right, I'm trying not to see red. I'm no. seeing I'm, my, my libertarian government screws up from every angle stuff is getting, ki- yeah, getting but triggered. Yeah, there, there, but there's the opposite side of that where uh, people will abuse the deal. So it's a, right. it's a double-edged sword. I'm not advocating for yeah. that deal. I'm just saying that's the reality so of it's that like, deal. Well, somebody had to write a regulation about housing, housing l- land use that would permit you to do this. They're like, we don't want people abusing it, so we have to put on paper some sort of protocol. Yeah. And, and, and so our, this our is, mission, this is it. honestly, is to the chronically homeless men and women yeah. that are living on the streets okay. uh, right so now. So you've got to be desperate enough that there's not really anything you can do until you get in there to help yourself, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So I've waited. There's a unit open. What comes next? You're going to be called in for an interview. Uh, there's been a whole application process and a number of different hoops that you've already jumped through. Now you get through that interview process. Uh, process well, you will be notified about two weeks out that you're going to be able to move into a home. You come back to the village and you go pick your home. And we put you in a golf cart, drive you around to the available units that we have available, and uh, you pick the one that you want to live in. In that interview process, you tell us, uh, God, I'm a Kansas City fan, or I love butterflies or Disney. And when you move into that house, it'll be fully furnished and decorated to your personality. It's a big step up. What comes next? What do, do I got? Do I have to pay anything? Do I have to? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I have to reciprocate for all this generosity? Yeah. Well, number one rule is that everybody pays rent. So okay. Uh, yeah. No matter what, average rent out there is 400 bucks a month. Yeah, so it's not nothing. It's you got to get four hundred bucks a month. How am I getting four hundred bucks a month? Eighty uh, percent of the people that are going to move in uh, are probably have SSI or SSDI, so they're earning about social security disability. Yeah, yeah, and then um, we have a number of micro enterprise programs on site. People last year earned about a million and a half bucks uh, doing a variety of things. Are products being produced that are getting sold to people outside of the community, or is it all just funds that's being donated and then sort of, um, if I can be uncharitable, kind of doled out to people to do things. No, there's not the dole out uh, piece of it. There's a big farming operation on site. We have 51 acres that has to be mowed and beautified. That's being done. Yeah, that's work. Somebody's got to do it. We have an aquaponics, hydroponics operation. We have uh, hundreds of chickens producing uh, free range organic chicken eggs. We have a car care business. We have a bed and breakfast. We have so folks are working on things that if they weren't doing it, you'd have to buy it from somebody. We Food, would, we would outsource and yeah. some things are outsourced. Yeah, cool. uh, We have an art house. We have uh, ceramics. We have uh, jewelry making. We have a great partnership with a company called Kendra Scott. Oh uh, yeah. That your wife should be well <laughs> aware of. And uh, I am, I am fortunate to be married to someone that isn't a huge jewelry yeah. fan. So. Well, uh, <laughs> and so um, we, we have lots of opportunities for people to earn uh, dignified income and, uh, and, and earn it. We expect people to earn it. Yeah. How important is earning it? Well, it goes back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. It's key to who we are as human beings. And only when we are settled and we're cultivating are we really in a position where we can care for the things that are outside of our own selfish need. So on the street corner, the hands out. In the village, the hands up. It's a different model. When we have things like uh, Snowmageddon and the big freeze and the this, that, and the other that happen, watch what happens in our community. People jump, jump in. Jump in. Making things happen. Helping people out. So I'm there. I'm working. What else is there to help me? I was addicted to methamphetamines. Well, you, you could still be addicted to methamphetamines, and there are plenty of people there that uh, have that, uh, that on their back. There is a recovery program there. Uh, we have a partnership with Communities for Recovery. They're on site with a number of employees. But you got to remember that your recovery depends a thousand percent on you. Right. Nobody else is in charge of that deal. You have to go and do all the work. 
Is Alcoholics Anonymous on site? Is that a thing that people? Yeah, there are, are AA meetings in? and NA meetings. Narcotics Anonymous, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Those are those are there. Those twelve step programs. Most yeah. people have been through multiple. 12 step programs and they get sick of them. I'm a fan of the 12 step program. Yeah, I understand they, they work. Well, uh, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You've said in this conversation that making this your home, making this your community, such that maybe you will die in this community feeling connected, feeling loved. Is there stuff saying, hey, you've got aptitudes or you had a degree in this thing and you can go and get a job out there where you're going to make enough money where you don't need to be here anymore? What's happening? For that, for the person that has the potential to and wants to ultimately, yeah. So the move average on. average age is fifty-seven years old. Oh wow! Okay, sixty-five percent of the people that live in this community, self-reported, have two or more comorbid diseases. Sixty-six percent use illicit drugs. Average time on the streets is nine years. Okay, which means somebody's been there 40 years, somebody's been there a minimum of one year. The average age of death is 59. Oh, that changes the way I'm thinking about this yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, there's no fix and repair. These are, when I say unemployable, that doesn't mean unpurposeful. We have an extraordinary number of very purposeful people, but they're not going to come and work at McDonald's and Walmart and be a good employee. They're, they have uh, mental health issues, they have physical health issues, they have addiction issues, they have uh, issues of obedience. Most of them are very entrepreneurial, ADD yeah. type of people like me. Is that a function of selection? Is that a snapshot of pe the chronically homeless? It's an accurate snapshot of the chronically homeless population. I know that most people that you will see on the street will own, will spend less than two weeks there. That, that like, uh, there's I don't something, know that there's something the like case. that. Uh, you'll hear all kinds of different I don't know, uh, you know, it's numbers. I, I don't really know what the trends are. If you look at the numbers and we, we have an organization here in town, uh, echo that yeah. manages the homeless management information system. And, uh, there appears to be a trend down in in the age range we went from an average age of about 58 59 to 57 which was a significant uh, drop is that trend going to continue to fall which means younger people are yeah. coming in and, and that will that will dictate uh some things uh, for the future maybe we don't know if younger people are coming in what the hell is wrong with our country do they tend to be someone who's had a broken life from early on? 100%. So they've kind of come in and out of being engaged in civil society and, and like gotten on the train and fallen back off and gotten on and fallen back off? Look, when you, when you come from the life that these men and women have come from, they are virtually never getting off that train. Imagine you selling your son when he's 12 to other men. Yeah, no, I can't so do that. <laughs> read my read, read read chapter nine of my book about my buddy Will Langley who died this past year, my age. His father was selling him to other men. And if your daddy was raping you as a five year old, six year old, seven year old, your brothers got in on the action, then the uncles got in on the action, and by the time you're twelve, you 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 you've left home and you're riding the rails as a woman. Guess, guess what's going on in that deal, you know? And, and you're on the streets for 40 years. This is who lives. That's my next door neighbor in the community. Trauma that you can't fathom. And you don't heal from this. That This healing is made up in our brains. You don't, you don't heal from this level of trauma. You could ask virtually every woman, in our community, about 25 to 30 percent of the folks that live in our community are women. How many times they've been sexually assaulted in their life? Oh, I've got to imagine all of them have more. Well, or less. but they many, can't answer many how times. many. I mean, you know, if you get get into your peer group, you know, one in four of the women that you know out there statistically have experienced a a 
single sexual assault moment, which is traumatic in and upon itself. Yeah. What about so many times that there's no there's no recollection of the number? Oh, it was fifty two times or twenty four times or how often do you encounter folks, frankly like myself coming into this conversation, who they're thinking that your job and what and the promise of what you do is to help these people that they see on the street get out and become productive members of society and can't get their head around what it is that you're actually doing. Because I came into this conversation with a different understanding than I have now. Is that the story that you str you have to tell the most to people who come in and like, oh, you've got the answer. You've got the solution. We can replicate what you're doing in, in my town. Yeah, Mobile Oz and Fishers has five corporate goals. Goal number one is to transform the paradigm as to how people view the stereotype of the homeless. So this, this, this comes at me every single day. Yeah. Are they violent? You know, what's security like out here? You know, uh, how long are they going to live here? And embedded in that question is, are you fixing and repairing them and they're going to get an apartment complex in Pflugerville and get married and get a car payment and a house payment? Yeah. No, we, every, every day, which is good. This is what we want to do because the more we educate people to the realities of what we're dealing with, the more uh, people will understand and get uh, even deeper engaged in the work that we're doing. You said there's five, so that's number one. What, what are the others? To help people rediscover their God-given uh, gifts to do purposeful work. Uh, to reconnect uh, people to self, family, uh, and community, to inspire people into a lifestyle of abundance by giving their best uh, first. And uh, my old uh, old brain here is, uh, oh, to connect human to human, heart to heart through the fellowship of food and, and hospitality. And uh, pretty simple. Very good. Yeah. You know, we've talked a lot about brokenness in this conversation but you're doing hopeful beautiful work you're engaged in a community that is that clearly enriches your life are you fundamentally an optimist or a pessimist how do you think about no i'm fundamentally your... uh, an, an optimist but i'm not a i, I don't uh, operate on the fix and repair cure solve spectrum that people would want i'm a realist there's a poem that was written i can't remember by who uh, and it had something to do with uh Father Oscar Romero uh, called a prophet of a future, not our own. And, you know, we're only here for a, a puff of smoke. Poof. That's all. In the, in the scheme of time, poof, you're here and you're gone. We're, we're going to be dead. And during our lifetime, the movement that you have in terms of the kingdom work is infinitesimal, almost not measurable. No matter how big you think you are, no matter how this all comes out, no matter how big the village and the movement, yeah. you know, becomes, it's teeny tiny over the scheme of uh, in infinity. The hope that I have is the hope that the work that I'm doing is the work that God has called me fundamentally to do. I know at my core that I have been called. He came to me. He spoke to me through that catering truck and has led me for these 25 plus years down this road to make a difference in all kinds of people's lives, not only the lives of the people that have been lifted up off the streets, but also our lives that are being transformed because our stereotypes yes. are changing. And I can take people and I can drive up underneath this bridge right here, right out your front door mm -hmm. and show them hopelessness. And I can drive them about eight miles from here and show them hopefulness. You know, I raised my family for 34 years in Westlake Hills, the same house. For six and a half years, I've lived in this village. And it's the most extraordinary, most diverse, most joyful place that I've ever been. And it's got a side salad attention that's hard to fathom because I've got the meth guys, the crack guys, the fentanyl guys, the heroin guys, the alcoholics the convicted felons, people dying all around us in a beautiful way that is just hard for me to describe. You and I want to hide ourselves 
That's why when we push everything to the furthest fringes of our society and we don't get to see it, because we don't want to see the bicycles being stolen or the prostitute after turning 10 tricks last night because she needed the crack uh, cocaine or the male that's selling himself in order to support his drug habit. You and I don't want to see these things that are happening ubiquitously all around us in this neighborhood right here. It's happening right, right now. And the only way that we're ever going to be able to manage it is to bring it in close uh, to us and, and really love it the way that God fundamentally called us to, to love the most despised and outcast of our society. I'm extremely hopeful, and I love getting to do what I get to do. It's bottom line. Before we wrap up, I have some other questions I want to have. I want to I end every, try to end every conversation with some things that um, are universal. So let me, uh, I'm going to pull them out here. Um, That's a stack of universal questions. They're not too bad. We'll move them through them quickly. Yeah. I've only had one question ever asked of me that stumped me. In my, oh, and what was it? Uh, kindergarten class, St. Gabriel's Catholic School. So I give a little talk to the kids. I open it up for question. This little girl raises her hands and goes, Mr. Graham, what was it like serving the homeless on horseback? <laughs> I go, do I look that old to you, little girl? Anyway. So, All okay, right. Hey, yeah. Um. When you competed against your dad, did he let you win or did you have to earn it? You know, my dad wasn't there for the competition uh, to, to really uh, ensue, but uh, I did not let my kids win. And they won. They won when they won. This is an important one to me. I'm very curious how you, how you think about this. What does masculinity mean to you and what what is it? That Jordan Peterson, that question was kind of asked of him, and it was uh, that w we need to be in a place where we are capable of violence, hmm. yet we have the moral capability to withhold ourselves from that. This is how we protect people around us, because we as men are the protectors. Carry a sword, but keep it in the sheath. Yeah. Unless it really needs to come out. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What challenges your patience the most, and how do you overcome it? I can't stand for people to be late. I don't know if it comes from my uh, roughly one-third German uh, deal. If there's an 8.30 meeting, the meeting starts Apple watch time at 8.30. All right. What's the most dangerous thing you ever did as a child? Now, and, and it might, maybe it's stealing a bunch of cars and wrecking them. Is there something else besides what we've already talked about? Uh, you know, we had BB gun wars. Uh, like shooting each other? Yeah, no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah, crazy uh, stuff. You know, drinking and driving would be uh, yeah, an idiotic thing. I mean, I told my children when they grew up, I go, you know, the— the death penalty is only applied to one thing that you can do. And that is if I ever catch you drinking and driving, you're dead meat. I will inflict Armageddon on you. And, you know, I'm not sure. The, uh, but the fear was enough that uh, we didn't encounter that. Yeah, my dad, my dad had his life turned upside down by being hit by drunk. So I, I, that, that one resonates me with, yeah. resonates with me a lot. Um, good fear. Yeah. What's the most dangerous thing you've ever let your kids do? I don't take you as the helicopter parent type. No, we weren't helicopter parents. We were hunters and gatherer people and Second Amendment uh, people. My kids grew up with guns. Uh, all of it. <laughs> uh, you know, all of that, uh, you know, could be seen by somebody. But, you know, we're not jumping out of airplanes and uh, uh, things like that, although uh, I would consider that. So your kids are pretty free reign. That's good. Yeah. Free range kids. Yeah. What's the most valuable thing you've learned from your children? Probably uh, patience, particularly from my oldest uh, son. I completely lack patience. Uh, I don't remember how old he was, but we all went into a uh, Circle K or 7-Eleven and everybody get a candy bar. And, you know, you walk up to the plethora of candy that's up there. Just go pick one. But my oldest is analyzing every candy bar that's in 
those racks up there, and I'm losing my patience. And at one point in time, I have to tell him. Just pick a Snickers. Well, you got you got five seconds, five, four, three, and he's like, you know, this is freaking him out. You know, he grabs one, and the and the little turd ball will save the candy bar, and the rest of us, by the time we get to the car, have already consumed it. And so I had to learn a level of patience that I didn't have because of my oldest. Yeah, that's a good. That's a patience is a lesson I think we all get forced to learn with if you've got kids yeah. for sure. What do you want written on your gravestone? I don't know. I don't. Uh, are you going to have one? Are you going to do cremation? What do you think? No, I'm going to be cremated, and uh, and our goal is to be put in the columbarium there in the village. Uh, there's not much room. It's not like a real headstone. You get your name and your birth, and uh, maybe one little line. So there's not going to be some scripture sentence or something like that. So. Uh, uh, I think it'll be extraordinarily simple, and I'll be there with the uh, the crackheads, the glue sniffers, and the prostitutes, which is where I want to be. Well, as a Christian, that's where he put himself, so yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, again, we know I know your dad was not very present, but to the extent he did, did you? What did your dad teach you about God? Anything? I know your mom did. Yeah, my mom did. I say my mom was the uh, the driving force. Uh, you know, I think my dad glommed on to Christ uh, toward the end. Uh, I know before he died, he made a twenty five thousand dollar gift to the Methodist Church there in Alvin. I don't know if he was trying to little know, indulge by a little way, indulgence. Uh, <laughs> he should have picked the Catholic Church. We have a whole like business unit for that. Stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably not that. Not not as much as you would uh, think. My dad and I got reasonably close uh, in the latter stages of his uh, his life, yeah. but he he struggled, uh, you know, mightily, and it was difficult for him to have a relationship with all four of us. Alan, that's all I have for this. I have one final question. We're called Dad Saves America, and so I ask every guest. How do you see your role in the American story as an American? You know, 80, 90 percent of the people in the village uh, and extraordinarily diverse uh, people from all walks of life, color, backgrounds, you know, trauma, call my wife mama. And I would say 40 to 50 percent call me papa. And I think we represent the essence of a mother and father that they never had. That was the mother and father that were disciplinarians, but also uh, extraordinary nurturers. Like we have our grandson and uh, we love this little tyke and, you know, he's only one, but he prefers Trisha. I mean, he, he's got me, but in moments where he needs something more, <laughs> there's that deal uh, to her. And I, I think we want people to see uh, the paternal and the maternal nature of, of who, we, who we are. That's I think, uh, would, be, would be great. Thank you for being on Dad Saves America, Alan Graham. I have learned a lot in this conversation, and God bless everything that you and your wife and your community are doing. I appreciate it. Uh, come on out and check us out, man. I will. Yeah. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you. 